my face shall be sight the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend even so
deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now say. live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best song. Faithful loving servants true to him belongs. Love lifted me Sweet often. 
of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior Standing on the promises Standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Promises of God, my Savior, stand stand I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Yes, I'm standing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God.
stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross with a deep The yellow rose is the rose of Texas. It signifies friendship. Jeans is a favorite. Better? <laughs> what you see before you are 82 yellow roses. The yellow rose is the yellow rose of Texas. It signifies friendship. And it was Jean's favorite flower. Each rose represents the number of years that Jean has been with us. And what you saw at the end was Katie placing the 83rd rose, which marks the 83rd year that they would have known each other. Jean and Katie knew each other from birth, born in the same place, across the same room, it's been well known that they've shared pretty much everything for 83 years. This 83rd rose represents their 83 years together until they meet again. Please join me in prayer. Precious Father, this morning we come to you not in mourning, but in celebration celebration of the life you have blessed us with. A life that you use to weave each and every one of us together as only you can. Lord, you have used Gene in many powerful ways, but the most important way was to share the beautiful name of your son Jesus with everyone that he knew and everyone that he met. Lord, help us not to reflect on how Jean is no longer with us, but instead help us to reflect on the joy that you've given us through him. Let us reflect on how he has inspired us, how he has encouraged us, and most of all, how he loved us all. Lord, this morning we gather together to celebrate the life Jean led here and the eternal life that we know he now has with you. Thank you for the legacy of faith he left. He was truly a gift to us all. Amen. I am a part of the Fellowship of the Unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense, and my future is secure. I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, chintzy giving, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praise, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by presence, lean by faith, love by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. My pace is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few, my guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pull of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I will not give up, back up, let up, or shut up until I preached up, prayed up, paid up, stored up, and stayed up for the cause of Christ. 
I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until he returns, give until I drop, preach until I'll know, and work until he comes. And when he comes to get his own, he'll have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear. The author of that piece was a Rwandan pastor in 1980 who was told by his tribe to renounce his faith or he would be executed. And he refused to do so, and so he was immediately killed. And the following day, when they picked up his belongings, they discovered this very famous mantra called the Fellowship of the Unashamed. The reason I share that is those words mirror many of the things that my dad was all about. My dad was a strong man. Some would say a stubborn man. <laughs> but he loved, a, he loved a lot of things. And he specifically loved three things. He loved Jesus. Oh my, did he love Jesus. And he loved telling people about Jesus. He also loved the church. He believed in the church. He was, as Pastor Steve and I talked about, he was, he was always a pastor's friend. He loved the church and being in church. And he also loved family. Gosh, he loved family. He was all about reunions and gatherings and events. In fact, uh, as we speak right now in a little city called Das, Texas, the annual Hanley Re Re Owen reunion, which my dad loved and adored, is going on. And as we speak, they've piped into this service, so many of them are, are watching online. In fact, there's, there's countless people all around the nation that are watching the live stream video right now of what we're doing here. And my dad would, would have loved it because, again, he loved Jesus, he loved the church, and he loved family as well. You know, my dad was an amazing athlete in high school. He was a quarterback, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try to take the role of a quarterback today, and I'm going to kind of direct traffic. So I just want to walk you really quickly through the program and tell you what we're about to, uh, about to do. Uh, and by the way, as you do that, my dad lived a blessed life, a very blessed life. It's obvious to me and others that God's hand of blessing was on him. And so this theme of a blessing is going to be something you're going to be hearing throughout today. Uh, first of all, all four of, of Gene and Katie's kids are going to be part of this program. My brother Gary is going to be reading the, the obituary, the memoriam, which is written by Andy. Andy did a great job with that. Kathy's going to be sharing uh, one of Dad's favorite scripture, and I believe that this passage from John 14 are ver the very words that my dad would want to be speaking to each one of you today. In addition to writing the obituary, Andy's Gospel Quartet, Common Bond, will be performing via soundtrack two of da 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 my dad's favorite uh, songs. Uh, songs, and, and the ones he really loved were, were Andy had the solo, and there's a couple of these songs Andy's going to be singing. You'll hear Andy singing. We're also looking forward to hearing from four of the grandchildren who are going to speak today, three in person and one by video, and we're really looking forward to that as well. They're GG Reflections. We're honored to have Pastor Steve with us, who's going to bring a message that would be the exact words my dad would want shared. So thank you, Steve, for sharing today. And as a special uh, tribute to my dad, my daughter, Brooke, put together a pictorial video. And before that video shares, I'm going to get back up and speak for about 10 minutes uh, and just give you some, some reflections before we show that video. So that's kind of what's going to happen. I always think people enjoy knowing, no surprises, right? We're all, good, we're all in this together. So with that being said, Gary, would you come forward and read the, the memoriam? Good morning. Uh, wow. Let's celebrate. Uh, glory to God. Leonard Eugene Hanley, better known as Gene, 82 years old, passed away peacefully on July 12th, 2021. Gene was born to Harmon Leroy and Ann Lou Hanley on October 10, 1938, and was raised in Lockney, Texas. During his childhood years, Gene was a frequent visitor on his horse to a neighboring group of sisters that piqued his interest. It was the oldest of this clan that caught his eye after graduating from Lockney High School in 1957. In the fall, Gene began college at Texas Tech while Katie Ray Rucker started at McMurray College. Gene and Katie were married on June 14, 1958 in Lockney, Texas. As Rod mentioned, Gene excelled in athletics, leading his high school football, basketball, and track teams. 
After high school, he was passionate about golf. Hallelujah. <laughs> Which didn't sit well with his father-in-law when work was to be done in the fields. In 1968, after 10 years of farming cotton, wheat, and other row crops, Katie, the three boys, and a new baby girl moved to East Wenatchee, where he embarked on a new adventure of growing apples. Their first winter in January 1969 was devastating, and the producing orchard he purchased died in the hardest winter the valley had seen on record. Starting from scratch, Gene pulled and replanted their orchard and took on extra work as a journeyman welder, working most of the steel pipelines which were being built to supply valley orchardists with water. I like to call that living water. Welding expanded into a business producing the valley's first four-bin hydraulic swamping trailers. How many know about the swamper? Yep. Today, his vision of hydraulic trailers are in every very large commercial orchard. He also built fifth wheel trailers, which many of the growers haul their crops to the sheds. Those trailers built in the 70s and 80s can still be seen moving crops to market. Even though Gene slowed down in his later years, he never really retired. He was involved in his orchards to the very end giving advice and direction, whether it was asked for or not. <laughs> Gene was an active member of the Wenatchee Valley Baptist Church and Eastmont Baptist Church, where he served many years as a deacon of both congregations. He was faithful and generous to the church, leading many people to the Lord. He was a Sunday school teacher and a mentor. One of my childhood friends, Jim Ellis, just shared a story with us on Facebook. He said, Gene and my dad were besties, as they say now. When my dad, Buddy Ellis, was the preacher at Wenatchee Valley, this led to many great friendships, especially with Gary and Andy. He was always a great man to me, awesome sense of humor, and I learned a thing or two about work ethics, getting up with the boys on sleepovers to move sprinkler pipes in the morning. He will always be remembered fondly at the Ellis house, and I'm pretty sure that was the last sleepover that Jimmy came over to <laughs> spend with us. One of the spiritual highlights that Gene and Katie uh, experienced was going on a Baptist mission trip to Kenya in 2008, right during the middle of their 50th wedding anniversary, by the way, to assist with an orphanage school and with digging water wells. Even though he was tough and had strong convictions, Gene was soft-hearted and loved his children, his extended family, and the many friends that surrounded him. He was also coached to many of his children's teams and served on numerous county boards. Gene was most proud of the work he did as director at Growers Credit Corporation, playing a key role in building and financing orchards across North Central Washington. Gene is survived by his sister Elizabeth Litch in Lubbock, Texas, He's also survived by his wife, Katie, his three sons, Rod, wife, Jan of Lee's Summit, Missouri, Gary, wife, Jan of Tampa, Florida, Andy, wife, Shane of East Wenatchee, and daughter, Kathy Nosick, and husband, Jim of East Wenatchee, Washington, as well as 10 grandchildren, Tori, Raymond, Drew, Justin, Holden, Derek, Blake, Brooke, Jacob, and Trent and five great-grandchildren, Ezra, Avienda, River, Theo, and the newest, Charlie Ray. Thank you. When the last word 
has been spoken And there's nothing left to say Only one thing really matters At the end of life's long day Jesus, have you called his name? When you know Jesus, you will never be the same. Does the singing really move you And put a smile on your face One thing more would make the difference Do you know the Savior's grace? called his name when you know Jesus you will never be the same of all the things you've heard and seen don't forget just what it means the greatest thing in life is who you know. Do you know Jesus? Have you called His name? John 14, 1 through 6. Just a minute. <laughs> um, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going to be there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Mm -hmm. 
So we're just going to share a few memories that we have of Gene. Um, just a couple of things that I remember personally. Um, it's just he was very strong-willed and very compassionate, and you know, and he was pretty stubborn too. Um, but you had to love that about him, you know. And he was always coming to to check on us. So when we'd be in harvest or just doing all the projects that we we do, he'd always come in to see what we're doing, come stop us, come talk to us. And, just, you know, see, see what was going on. Um, you know, and he also, he always had, not only would he check on us, he'd also, he had some kind of a goal or a mission that he was always after, and he was always doing something. And I can't say how many times he would track me down on his phone, because he always had us all GPS enable our phones so he could find us. <laughs> so he would, he would track me down and go, Drew, I see you're at the barn. I'm going to need you to come do this. Or, oh, I see you're in the cider. Can you come over here and, and come help me out? <laughs> so... He was just always tracking us down, but you know it was it was really great, and being able to spend that time with him uh, was pretty special. And and the only other memory I really wanted to share is we had our recent road trip about a couple months ago over to the West Coast, and I got to spend about eight hours with him. And you know it was really a special time for me, and we really got to talk. And and he told me his whole man, whole life story. But he told me a lot of his life story, and and I just really appreciated that time that I that I got to spend with him. All right, like it has been said before, my grandpa Gene has been the epitome of a role model for the generations before me, as well as the generations that follow. Even being raised away from the Wenatchee Valley, Gene's influence still played a vital part of who my brother and I have become today. He was a steadfast and devoted Christian who, was not, who knew what hard work was. He knew to lean on God and the good and the bad and he knew to provide for his family. Ray and I were taught by our father to follow the actions of successful, godly men, and Gene, even with his stubbornness, was exactly that. He has been a close mentor to my brother in the years that he has moved to Wenatchee with his faith, his family, and the many hard decisions that Ray has had to make just as Gene did when he loaded his family onto that plane onto their next adventure. He has touched the lives of all that are here in attendance and those that are viewing from afar. I wish he could have met some of the newest additions to the family, my son, Charlie Ray, and the newest, Hunter, Blake and Katie's son. But your influence will still be passed on to them. I wish I would and could have spent more time with him. But Gigi, you will be missed, but your impact will never be forgotten. Like Justin, um, my family did not grow up in East Wenatchee, and so my time spent with Gigi and Grandma Katie and the rest of the family was our you know, reunions or our Hawaii trip or the cruise or going to Colorado and Texas and, and definitely spending time here, which we love. Um, and so while Gene's impact on me is less than, I mean, Drew and uh, Andy and Shane's children, I mean, I get to see his M impact on my dad and then my dad's impact on me. And so Gigi, I mean, instilled an incredible work ethic in my father and his love for athletics was passed on to me. That, that drive for excellence was passed on to me as well. Um, but just thinking about this um, morning, the biggest impact that I think Gigi had on my dad and my dad had on me and I hope to have on Micah and I's future children one day is the love for the Lord that he had. Um, I know my dad is where he is today because Gigi instilled in him the um, just excitement for the word of God and the souls of men and women. Um, and, and my dad instilled that on myself as well. And so I, I know this faith in growing up in a home that does commit their lives to the Lord. It started with Gigi and it started with Grandma Katie. And so thank you all for what, how you raised your children. And thank you, Dad, for how you raised us. And, and that is the generational legacy I, I, I know will continue. Um, and so just very thankful for, for Gigi and his impact and getting to be here today. Thanks, y'all. Hi, friends and family. Grandma, I'm especially sorry that I couldn't make it today. I'm feeling a little bit under the weather, but I wanted to contribute my part. So when you're young, grandpas teach you things like how to drive a golf cart, how to shoot ravens out of the canyon, how to drive a golf cart, and the value how to shoot ravens out of the canyon and the value of two dozen Krispy Kreme donuts. 
because you're going to need some for tomorrow. That's what Gigi taught me. Not everyone was as blessed to have Grandpa Gene as I was. He could be tough, but I knew that was what I needed. To me, his teachings were subliminal, and I see that more and more each day. The military made me appreciate a lot of things, but it never made me appreciate anything more than the pride it gave my grandfather. I didn't need for him to say it, because he never did. His actions showed it. Our regular conversations consisted of conspiracy theories, which fruit was being grown, and which politicians had nicknames for each other. His favorite was Sleepy Joe. Honestly, I didn't care what the topic was. I was just happy to spend time with Gigi. And I think that was always the point. To this day, I'm unveiling some of his wisdoms that he set upon me. And I'll continue to do so until my time comes. But until then, I'll do my part ensuring my family knows the history of our Gigi. I love you and I'll miss you forever. I wish that someone had told me that the grandkids called him Gigi. I'd have had a whole lot of fun with that. <laughs> I'm Steve Brewer. I had the, the privilege of being Gene's pastor for over a decade and his pr friend for nearly, nearly 20 years. In fact, I had to promise him that I would come back and do his service. I kept saying to him, you're not going to die. But we all knew that that was going to take place sometime. At the same time, it's with confidence that I know that though he might be dead, he is yet alive. Amen. Alive in Jesus. And I also was always confident that he was my friend. He was a pastor's friend. I remember that he was not just my friend, and, and so many things he did showed his friendship to me and my wife. I got to visit them down in Harper, Texas, and uh, I know that he's not just a friend to pastors, he's a great friend to pastors, but he's got so many other friends. He's got friends right down there, down there in the, in the camping ground. He had to show me where they did the reunion as we drove up through the creek and all, and, and uh, where he parked, what was going on. And so for those of you that are watching on, uh, on, on a live stream, I, I just kind of bring you uh, greetings from the Wenatchee Valley. And uh, I, I grieve along with you, and yet at the same time, I expect to see Brother Gene again. As my friend, I could share so many things that he did in my life, from calling me up and, uh, and, and complaining a little bit and asking for, for insight as to why I made a, a decision that I did. See, I appreciate that because so many never talk to the preacher. They just leave the church. But that wasn't Gene. We may not always agree on everything, but he would always tell me what it was that was on his heart and his mind. And usually after I got to explain myself, we kind of agreed at the end. He... Uh, and he and my mother and my wife got together on my 60th birthday. And unbeknownst to me, I'd always wanted a fishing boat. He had a fishing boat that he wanted to sell. And uh, my mom and my wife got together with Gene and bought his boat sight unseen to me. And really, I don't know, to them. And, uh, and it presented it to me on my 60th birthday as a surprise gift. And Gene was so excited that he got to give his, uh, his pastor a, 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 his fishing boat. He, he also, when he bought this, uh, this motorhome, almost insisted that I take it out and use it. Now, I refuse to do that because I've had experiences of borrowing things from people that I love and respect and breaking them. And so I did not want that to happen. But I, I just felt about that high because I kept saying, no, Gene, I don't want to take it. And he'd kind of insist again. We, uh, we spent time having, having dinners together. We spent time over at his house. He, he kept offering uh, to, uh, to show me places when we first moved into the valley to buy his house there on 8th Street, some lots that he had at that time. 
we ended up not buying any of those and buying it in another place, but I almost felt like I was hurting him by not buying his stuff. <laughs> he was a preacher's friend, and I knew he was a preacher's friend because even before he joined Eastmont Baptist Church, I had the opportunity to travel with him over to First Baptist Lakewood. His friend, my friend, Buddy Ellis, had passed away unexpectedly. I had known Buddy not only while he was pastoring at Wenatchee Valley, but also while he was pastoring in Parkland, uh, in next to where I was pastoring in Puyallup in the, uh, on the uh, uh, west side. And, and we'd become good friends. When he passed away, I, 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 uh, I got a call from Gene, says, will you drive with me over so we can attend the funeral services for Buddy? and so I don't have to drive by myself. And we spent a good, a good eight hours together that day, just chatting, chat, chatting about the church, chatting about pastors, chat, chatting about his life, his love, his, his, the things that went on in his life. And I thought to myself, even before he became a member of Eastmont Baptist Church, I'd sure like to have a guy like him join our church. Well, that eventually happened in about 2006. He and Katie came on over. I was a, it was a great joy for me. He became one of my supporters, part of our, our deacon body. He had long been a teacher. In fact, uh, Cliff Larson commented last week in his Bible study that uh, Gene, who had been a part of Cliff's group by Zoom, uh, had, uh, had been his teacher earlier. And so he, he was just uh, now kind of grieving at the loss of his original Sunday school teacher and saying what a privilege it was to be his teacher's teacher at the end. Gene loved the church. He loved pastors. He loved people. But you know, being a friend of a pastor doesn't get you to heaven. Doesn't get you to heaven. I wish it would. And you could all be my friend. But that's not going to get you to heaven. But there is a scripture that tells you how you do get to heaven. In fact, we read it in the book of James, here in the second chapter, verse 23, and says the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he, Abraham, was called the friend of God. Gene was God's friend. How do I know that? Because Jean believed the Word of God and the person of God, Jesus Christ. And when you are God's friend, you are made righteous. Not because Jean was perfect. We all know that he wasn't. Katie especially. <laughs> but Jean was righteous because his sin were forgiven by Jesus Christ. And because of that, I can stand here and tell you assuredly that this last week when Gene passed away, it was not a sad moment for him, but it was a glorious moment. It was a time in which he graduated. The commencement of his life and dreams, he went on to glory. That's how we used to call it. And, and he began to realize the culmination of everything that he had taught and spoke about and read about while he was walking the face of this earth. You see, he would tell you right now that it's true, all of it's true. There is a real heaven. There is a real salvation. Eternity is real, and I am a part of it. Oh, I wish that he could come back and share that with us, even right now. Maybe it would convince some of us to believe the same things that he believed. Some that might not be believing those things right now. Gene had a number of friends here on earth, and one group of those friends that he had was a group that he met uh, with almost daily, had coffee with every morning. There were people there like Jerry Bartram, who just went on to be with the Lord. People like Wayne Cooper, who is still here. People like Bruce Gray. We could probably count others. I actually showed up to that group every once in a while when they met on that red barn on 8th Street. I didn't go very regularly because for a preacher getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm not a farmer. That's kind of early to drink coffee. <laughs> but they met, and they were great friends. 
Now, what does a good friend do? One thing that good friends do when they're a friend of Jesus is try to tell their friends about Jesus. In fact, we read about a situation like that in the scripture where Andrew came to know Christ and he wanted his brother to know Jesus too. And so he introduced Peter, his brother, to Jesus. I was often asked to pray for, for Bruce because Bruce didn't know Christ, but Bruce was a great friend of Gene's. And when it came down to the last few weeks of, of Bruce's life, Gene got together with his pastor at that time and, and, and asked if they could go and see him. And, and Bruce came to receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior, and that thrilled Gene. Nothing thrills the heart of a friend of God more than inviting and seeing his, his friends on earth come to know Jesus. So can I share with you, if you don't know Jesus and you want to, you want to make a difference right now and show your affection and love to Gene, come to know his friend, Jesus. Because I'm sure that Gene will hear the bells in heaven go off, and that will bring joy to his heart. So you ask, how do I come to know Jesus? Well, one of the ways that Gene would share his faith is through what we call the old Roman road. It's a gospel plan out of the book of Romans. And it begins with some bad news, and it ends with some very good news. And the bad news began with, all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. I'm a preacher. I've sinned. Gene would be the first to tell you he's sinned. All of us as human beings have not lived up to the perfect plan and expectation of God our Creator. We have all sinned. And because of that sin, it goes on in the book of Romans and says that the wages of sin is death. That's spiritual death, separation from God for all eternity. The bad news is that there's a real hell. I don't like mentioning that on a day in which we look back at the end of one's human life, unless I know that he's in a real heaven. But there is a real hell that we don't want to go to. And a real heaven that I hope you do go to. Because while the wages of sin is death, the gift of God, is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So how does Jesus, the very Son of God, give us eternal life? Well, Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated or showed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You didn't have to be good enough at, at, to go to heaven. Jesus came when you were bad and he died for you. He died nearly 2,000 years ago for you. He died to pay the penalty for your sin on the cross. And then three days later, he rose from the dead so that he might personally offer you salvation and prove that he really is who he claimed to be, the Son of God. But still, it's not automatic. Not everybody in the world, even though Jesus died for the sin of the world, not everybody is going to go to heaven. Well, then who does go to heaven? Those who put their faith and trust in Jesus. See, that's even a legal principle. It's funny how much of our real law, our, our, our legal law, is based upon the Bible. And... A couple of hundred years ago, there was a man by the name of George Wilson. George Wilson was a scoundrel. He was convicted of murder and robbery of a federal um, uh, post exchange. For that crime, he was sentenced to death. He, there was an appeal made for, for the life of George Wilson to the then President of the United States. Andrew Jackson was president of the United States. It's interesting today that people are trying to tear down his statue, but he was still president of the United States. 
And he pardoned, which was the presidential privilege, he pardoned George Wilson. But George Wilson refused to accept the pardon. Well, nothing like that had ever happened before. And so it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in those days, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was a man by the name of John Jay. And he wrote the deciding opinion. And he wrote that it would be inconceivable that a man who would pardon would not claim his pardon. But if a pardon remains unclaimed, the pardon is not in, in, is not in effect. And he went on to say that George Wilson must be put to death. That same legal principle applies today for those who do not receive Jesus Christ. It's not that Jesus did not die for the sin of the world and your sin and my sin, but unless we receive that free gift of salvation, that pardon that he gives to each of us, then the sin that we have committed, we bear ourselves. And the bad news of the Roman road, the wages of sin is death, applies to us. So how do you receive Christ? Well, there it says in the book of Romans once again, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you say, I believe in Jesus. I believe that Jesus died for my sin. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, the scripture says, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Many, many years ago, a sinner by the name of Gene Hanley as a youngster prayed and asked Jesus to come into his heart. It changed his life, it changed his family, and it changed his outcome. Jesus is a friend of God because Jesus accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. And right now, as one friend to another, Gene would be asking, imploring you, pleading with you, if you have not received Jesus, would you do so today? And I'd be remiss without giving you an opportunity to do that. I'm not going to ask you to come down in a Baptist church and stand in the front. But what I am going to do is lead us in a simple prayer. And if you would pray, having never put faith and trust in Jesus before, pray to put your faith in Christ. I believe that God will hear from heaven that prayer and save you because Scripture says, again in the book of Romans, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you would, will you bow your heads, bow your hearts, and if you've never before asked Jesus to come into your life, to save your soul, to give you a hope of heaven, might you pray just silently where you are, but, but intimately, honestly, pray to Jesus. Jesus, I know that I have sinned and sinned against you. I know that you died for my sin and that you rose from the dead. I know that you truly are God and that you can save my soul. So I ask you, Jesus, right now to forgive my sin and give me your eternal life. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I look forward to seeing my friend Gene in heaven again. And I look forward to seeing you, my Savior. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe later you'll be able to, to send an email or, or tell one of the family members. I prayed that prayer. It would be an encouragement to them.
mysteries Surely someday will come to an end Oh, but faith will conquer the darkness and death and will lead me at last to I believe that the Christ who was slain on the cross has the power to change lives today. Common Bond, in case you didn't pick up on that, it was a group that Andy was a part of. So, such, such great lyrics, such great song. You know, my dad lived a blessed life. God's hand of blessing was on his life. He, perp, he, was, he prospered, he was successful, and his success centered on three things that only last eternally. God, his word, and people. That's what my dad focused on. And you think about everything else in this world is temporal. It will not last forever. The houses, the money, the vehicles, the clothes, they don't last. My dad cared about things that lasted. My dad has always been my hero. I wanted to be grow, up, grow up just being like him. He taught me a number of life lessons. And I believe the words of James 1, captured the essence of his life, where it says, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Dad was always a man on mission. He always believed someone's words should match their actions. My dad walked the talk. The things he believed, he modeled, and he lived out every single day. And allow me just to share a few brief lessons that I learned from my dad. Number one, one of the greatest things dad taught me was how to treat mom and how to treat women with respect and honor. He did this, and he demanded his children do the same. Severe punishment and pain would have been involved if any one of us would have ever acted any other way. Number two, dad was always a tremendous provider. He understood the biblical responsibility for a man to provide for his household needs. And when things were tight financially, and they were, he found a way to put food on the table through various jobs, including plowing snow, welding jobs, and being an excellent marksman on deer and elk hunts in the Clockham. We prayed for those hunts would be successful. Number three, dad led our family spiritually. He made sure we were at church every single time the church doors were open. And he didn't drop us off at the doorway. He fulfilled his responsibilities of being a man of God. He met the description of a deacon in every level, as noted in 1 Timothy chapter 3, which reads in part that he must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, uncontentious, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. Dad not only possessed those qualities, he excelled in them. 
He lived out his faith according to God's word. Number four, my dad was generous in his giving. Once again, he recognized the value of giving way beyond tithes and offerings. He was generous to the Lord's work, and he was generous in sharing his resources, including time, talents, treasures, and touch with family and friends. Countless missionaries, pastors, old and new friends were welcomed in our home to share a meal or a bed. Allowing people to come into the orchards and pick up stray fruit was a given. He understood that it was more blessed to give than to receive. Number five, dad placed a high value on a strong work ethic. You know, a true leader never asks someone to do something they would not first do themselves. So dad was a hard worker leading by example. And when, when the work was done, he also understood the importance of rest and relaxation. Rarely do I ever remember him ever working on a Sunday, the Sabbath day. You know, God commanded us to work six days and on the seventh rest, and he lived out th that command. I've often said my dad knew how to work hard, but he also knew how to play hard. And some of the most memorable times with our family was when we were on the golf course together, on camping trips, vacationing in Hawaii. That was a way of him celebrating the fruits of his labor. Number, seven, number six, dad knew the importance of laughter. People enjoyed being in my dad's presence because he possessed a keen sense of humor. Dad and his dad, Harmon, knew how to keep everybody in stitches. From the time you awoke in the morning, gathered with the men drinking coffee, to the daily grind in the orchards and the barn, at church teaching Sunday school lessons, at the many games where he coached or were set in the stands, he did it with a positive attitude on his face. I remember on the golf course, I was always impressed how far he could hit the ball. I mean, it was just amazing how far he could hit it. And he had a very low handicap, and occasionally he would make a very bad chip shot, you know, chunk a shot and make a really bad shot, get it on the green and be facing a 50 or 60 foot putt. And this is what he always, he always would say. He says, you know, I would be upset right now if I wasn't such a good putter. And then he would sink it you know, every single time. Number seven, dad was a promise keeper before the ministry of promise keepers ever came into existence. His word was his bond. His handshake meant something to those he met. And when he committed to something, he was all in. His attitude and mindset was a critical factor in helping convince me to play football in high school and later in college. He helped me be, to be courageous when I was scared and when I didn't have confidence in myself. Number eight, dad was a risk taker. It's been said that there are those who make it happen, those who watch it happen, and those who wonder what happened. <laughs> Dad was a man of action. He was a man who made things happen. No dream was too small for him because he trusted in the Lord. And when you're confident God will guide you and lead you, guess what? It just happens. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says what? Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. That's exactly what my dad did. When he uprooted and came from Texas in 68 and moved his family to Washington State, it was probably the, a, a, a very amazing risk he took. And that risk defined his life. And I'm grateful he did so. I've often wondered what our lives would look like today if he had not made that huge decision most likely the legacy of all of us here today would look radically different. Number nine, dad made family a priority. His most precious moments were when his family was together with his four children, 10 grandchildren, five great-grandchildren, one soon to be born, so it would be number six. His sister Elizabeth, his nephews Kelly and Matt, and countless relatives from the Hanley-Owen reunion line, as well as the Rutgers too. I'll end with this. Here's a few of his favorite go-to phrases. Phrases that he made popular way before everybody else stole them from him. Here's what he would say. Stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. Right before spanking me, he would say, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. When we would play hard downstairs as boys, he would say, it smells like a gym in here. When we do something wrong or idiotic, he would say, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. He also said, don't talk back to your mom. Going to church is not an option for you. And if you're going to do a job, do it right. I also just want to mention this real quickly. I want to share just a couple words about my mom and dad's 63 years of marriage. You know, in a culture where many children grew up in a broken home, 
Mom and dad demonstrated resiliency and devotion to one another by not only surviving but thriving in their marriage. Their marriage is a testimony of the unconditional love for one another. They fought for their marriage and they always believed the best about each other. They understood the high responsibility and calling of raising children in a Christ-centered home. And they did an amazing job raising five remarkable and uniquely gifted children, if I do say so myself. And they were unified in their parenting. They set a high standard, desiring excellence in every step of the way. And I'm grateful they put the Lord Jesus Christ at the dead center of that, of their marriage. Jesus' perfect love for my parents is evidenced by his sacrifice on the cross through his shed blood for our sins and was the basis of their love for one another. Their marriage is a testimony of his mercy, his grace, and his forgiveness. I'm gonna sh we're going to share now the video tribute that my daughter put together called The Blessing. And I had a chance to be with my dad just minutes before he passed away. I flew back from Kansas City 14 hours in the air to find out that later the last words he spoke before uh, he went into a, a coma situation was, when is Rod going to get here? And my mom says, uh, as he says, is it tonight? And she says, no, not tonight, it's tomorrow night. And I really believe the Lord kept uh, my dad alive uh, through a bunch of hymns that Kathy and mom were playing for him all day on Sunday for me to arrive on a midnight flight uh, here into Wenatchee. And when mom shook him when I walked in the room and said, Rod's here, my dad immediately for the first time opened his eyes in over 36 hours. We locked eyes. He began to adjust his hearing aid. I said, Dad, I, want, I need to tell you some things. I need to talk to you. And for the next 20 minutes, we had a one-sided conversation. And all he did was nod and blink and acknowledge, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. I asked him, I asked him for a blessing. I said, Dad, I'm here to get a blessing. But I'm also here to give a blessing if you'll allow me to mom and Gary and Andy and Kathy and the grandkids. Words that we need to hear from you. Because you've lived a blessed life. Now let us, let me be your voice to pass on the blessing. And God gave me that privilege to do that. The next day we gathered after my dad had passed and we had a blessing ceremony and the aftermath of what happened and occurred is evidenced by what you're going to see in the video here. So let's roll the video. Precious memories on seen angels Sent from somewhere to my soul How they linger Ever near me And the sacred past unfold Precious memories my soul in the stillness of the midnight precious sacred scenes unfold precious father and loving mother fly across the lonely years and old home scenes of my childhood in fond memory appear precious memories they linger how they ever flood my soul in the stillness of the midnight 
precious sacred saints unfold that video it's too short <laughs> too short Kathy read a very important verse she says I am the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father but through me Steve shared the Romans road both of those verses clearly point out and I say this with all the love I can muster I'm not I'm not trying to judge I'm not trying to convict I'm not trying to do anything but I'm just telling you the truth if you want to see Gene again, you got to know Jesus. That's the only way. Scripture's clear. John, 1 John 5 says, The testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has eternal life. And then it says this, He who does not, does not know the Son does not have eternal life. 
If you've made a decision for Christ today, if you have said yes to Jesus, we'd love to hear from you. You can talk to me, Andy, Gary, Kathy, my mom, Steve. You can send me a text. You can send me an email. Or you could even come out and join us at the, at the home ranch, the home place at 988 South Union for uh, a lunch. It's free for all of you to come if you'd like to come. we got plenty of food. Believe me, we, we know how to do food with the Hamleys. We know how to do it really well. And uh, we invite you to come and join us for a meal. And it's important uh, that we actually leave really quickly from here because there's a wedding and there's people out in the hallway waiting to re reset the church up. So uh, we're, we're, we're gone. You ain't going to get a chance to visit with us. You want to visit with us? Come to lunch at our house. Barbecue, we'd love to have you. With that being said, have we celebrated today? Has this been good? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this beautiful ser service you've given us, this great celebration of a life well lived. Thank you, Lord, for the stories, for the scripture, for the songs, uh, the message, the strong message about Jesus and who Jesus is. And Lord, we thank you that uh, my dad, is, 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 his body is is changed and he is in glory now. He is in glory and he is, he is having a party and he wants us to party this afternoon as well. So thank you, Lord, for that. Just that hope, the hope we have. It's not a false hope, it's a real, real hope. Lord, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. You're dismissed. Hope you can come and join us at lunch, okay? Before you all leave, let's have the family go out first and uh, that way they can kind of shake your hand in the, in the foyer. Well, maybe, yeah, push you out, or we've we, we got we to gotta leave, but uh, anyway.
sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now say. live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best song. Faithful loving service true to him belongs. Love lifted me Yeah. 